Welcome to this teaching company course on the National Gallery in London. I'm Catherine Scallon. I'm a professor of art history at Case Western Reserve University in Cleveland, and I am delighted to be able to serve as your guide to this museum, which is my very favorite art museum in the world. That's a nice thing to say, but I have to justify nonetheless why, of all the art museums in the world, the teaching company should offer a course on this one. What makes the National Gallery in London important enough to justify so much attention? The best answer to that reflects the collecting policy of the National Gallery. The National Gallery in London collects only European paintings from the period 1250 to 1900. This makes it quite different as a museum from the Louvre in Paris or the Metropolitan Museum in New York, both of which have been subjects of earlier teaching company courses. They are encyclopedic collections that, uh, that collect examples of art from all over the world and do not limit themselves to any one artistic medium. You'll have paintings, but you'll have sculpture, you'll have furniture, musical instruments, all different kinds of objects. Clearly, a great deal can be learned from such a collection. But you can learn other things from a focus collection, such as that in the National Gallery. It is the best museum in the world to study if you want to learn about developments in European painting from the late medieval era to the turn of the 20th century. And that is not just my opinion. I think most scholars of this era would agree with that readily. The paintings in this museum not only include some of the greatest paintings by the most renowned masters, Raphael and Titian, Rembrandt and Rubens, Poussin and Claude, Velazquez and Goya, Gainsborough and Turner. These paintings also represent the achievement of many other artists active in the same eras who help us understand the general development of styles, subject matter, and painting techniques and materials. The National Gallery, in other words, has great depth and breadth in what it collects. Since my major focus as an art historian is on European paintings from 1400 to 1800, uh, it is no surprise, therefore, I've picked this out as my favorite collection in the world, and I was absolutely insistent on doing this course for the teaching company. In this first lecture on the National Gallery in London, I will cover four areas. First of all, I will discuss the history of the museum, concentrating on its founding, but bringing it down to the present time. Second, I will take you on a quick visual tour of the museum to clarify how the gallery spaces are organized. Third, I will discuss some of the behind the scenes work at the museum today that allows it to exhibit the collections in the best manner possible. And finally, I will discuss how the rest of the course is organized and how I decided on which works to include in it. After this introductory lecture, all the course lectures will be devoted to the study of specific works in this collection. So let us begin then with the history of the National Gallery. In one way, this museum started at a disadvantage. Most of the great museums for painting in Europe were formed from pre-existing collections put together by emperors, kings, or princes in cities such as Vienna, Madrid, and Paris. These collections were nationalized and opened to the public, sometimes in new buildings, sometimes in former palaces, such as the Louvre in Paris, which was originally a royal palace. New works were added to the collections over time, but some of the greatest masters were already very well represented in them. This process, by the way, really started taking place at the end of the 18th century and the beginning of the 19th century. This is the great era for the commencement of art museums. Once Great Britain also had a great royal art collection built up by Charles I. However, after he was executed in 1649 by the leaders of the English Civil War, his collection was sold off with many of the paintings being quickly bought up by other European rulers. His successors did start to collect again, 
but uh, the royal collection in Great Britain uh, in by the early 19th century, the decision was made that this was really a private collection belonging to the royal family and not the property of the state. Today, parts of it, in fact, are on view and open to the public at the Queen's Gallery in London, but this is an entirely separate administration from the state museums, such as the National Gallery. Now, by the beginning of the 19th century, many political and cultural leaders in Great Britain began to think that it really didn't reflect well on their country, that there was no great museum there where people could go to see paintings. The question is, why should that have even been an issue? Uh, As I said, public art museums were relatively new at this time, but it was beginning to be believed that they could play an important role in both, as both national symbols and as sites for public education. For instance, it was believed that viewing old master paintings and learning about art was civilizing, and that could be used to elevate the general education of the population of a state. It was a way of improving the population. Soon, too, though, such museums came to be seen as a symbols, status symbols, or just plain national symbols of a state. And this was at a time when nationalism was growing in Europe and competition between states was extremely strong. So they want certain kinds of institutions, in a sense, to have bragging rights. Great Britain did have the British Museum, which had been established in London in 1753, but that museum did not collect old master paintings. Another development that may have spurred on those who are promoting a national gallery for paintings has to do with the availability of works of art at this time. During the Napoleonic Wars, many works of art in Europe were displaced from their original locations. Some were taken as war booty, others were sold by impoverished uh, owners, churches and aristocrats alike. During the same period, a lot of religious institutions were nationalized, taken over and disbanded. And that meant that after the war, a number of works of art couldn't even return to their original locations. These paintings and others then began to flood the art markets of Europe and London, affording unprecedented opportunities to obtain great paintings. By the early 1820s, an ideal situation was in place for developing a gallery of old master paintings. But the government of Great Britain was uh, reluctant to take any action. Among other things, uh, the government, of course, worried about the cost of such uh, an institution. Unexpectedly, however, the government received an unexpected financial windfall when the Austrian Empire actually paid back a war debt that nobody expected them to repay. In 1823, several cultural leaders who had been pushing for the establishment of a gallery encouraged the government to act at that moment to take an important step by purchasing the collection of 38 paintings that had been assembled by John Julius Angerstein. Angerstein was an important financier in London and an astute collector who had just died. And even though the number of paintings doesn't sound great, 38, what he had bought was both wide-ranging and perfect examples of certain artists. Parliament agreed to do so, spurred on as well by the promise of donations from other collectors, and the National Gallery opened in the spring of 1824. Its first home was actually the former residence of Angerstein at 100 Pall Mall. There the collection began to grow through bequests and the occasional purchase. In 1823, for instance, Sir George Beaumont, who was an amateur painter and collector, had promised to donate paintings from his collection in order to spur on the founding of the gallery. His collection finally came to the museum in 1836. The first keeper, or curator we might call him, of the National Gallery, was William Seguier, an artist and art dealer. He really worked for the trustees of the National Gallery and had little independent authority. And it is true that in the first several decades of the history of the museum, it was really the small board of trustees that held uh, the power, including the financial power. 
Discussions soon began about creating a new and appropriately grand home for the National Gallery. Here, too, competition with continental models was important, since monumental new museum building projects had begun in cities such as Berlin and Munich in the 1820s, so that competitive nationalist spirit is alive here, too. Discussions were carried on, and in 1831, the decision was finally made to go forward, and a site was picked, that of Trafalgar Square, an important public place in London, and one accessible to both the wealthy and the less wealthy in London. And again, remember the educational purpose of this institution. The museum building here, this new building, was finally ready in 1838. And it had been designed in a classical style by William Wilkins. And using a classical style was really the norm at this point for these new art museums. They truly were temples of art. They had to share the building for a few decades with the Royal Academy, which ran a school and held exhibitions of its members' art. But the, uh, most of the primary gallery space was turned over to the National Gallery. Expansion of the collection proceeded. Perhaps the most important figure in the 19th century growth of the museum was Sir Charles Eastlake. He first served as keeper from 1843 to 1847, and then after a structural reorganization of the National Gallery, was its first director from 1855 till his death in 1865. For the first time, they had both a director and someone other than the trustees who actually had some real authority to run this museum and make purchases. Eastlake took advantage of the robust art market of the 19th century and made many important acquisitions, building even greater strength in Italian Renaissance art, which was the heart of this collection from its founding. Certainly, the collecting patterns of the directors and trustees, which followed conventional taste in this era, which rated the paintings of the Italian Renaissance masters as the most important, followed by 17th century Flemish, Dutch, and French uh, paintings. The building itself had to be expanded twice in the 19th century, and the Royal Academy finally had to leave as well. There were six more expansions during the 20th century. The last major expansion was the addition of the Sainsbury Wing in 1991, about which I'll speak a little later. In the course of the 20th century, areas of the collection that had been neglected earlier were now also developed. For instance, early German painting, 15th century German painting, for instance, became an area of focus. 18th and 19th century French painting needed attention as well. But the conservative taste of the trustees of this museum prevented the purchase of the most innovative French painters of the second half of the 19th century, the Impressionists and the Post-Impressionists. Fortunately, there were several private citizens who came and helped. A bequest of paintings by the art dealer and advocate of modern, modern art, Sir Hugh Lane, in 1917, included Impressionist paintings, and this helped to begin changing the situation. The donation of a fund in 1923 by Samuel Courtauld, an industrialist and collector, was uh, made expressly to support the purchase of Impressionist and post-Impressionist paintings. These two bequests enabled the National Gallery to make up for lost time and to acquire wonderful examples of these movements. And even still, new paintings are coming into the collection today in this area, these areas. With the founding of the Tate Gallery in the late 19th century, many of the British paintings in the National Gallery moved across town. Periodic renegotiations have meant that a strong representation of this school, however, uh, for 18th and 19th century British art, is still able to be seen at Trafalgar Square. Meanwhile, the Tate Gallery itself has split into two. There is now Tate Britain, which shows the developments of the history of British art, and the Tate Gallery, which shows uh, more modern foreign art. The National Gallery had become a revered institution by the 20th century, but its importance as a national symbol only became clear during World War II. 
The collections were removed from London beginning in 1939, but Winston Churchill declared that they would not be sent abroad for safekeeping. It had been suggested that they go to Canada or the United States, which would serve as guardians. Churchill's response was to say, hide them in caves and cellars, but not one picture shall leave this island. Uh, this, again, was extremely important uh, as a kind of ideology of you know, wartime patriotism. Rather, the, the decision was made to send the paintings to Wales, where first they were put into uh, buildings, both public and private. Later, it was decided even Wales might be vulnerable to bombing, and so they were moved into an old slate mine in Wales. The paintings were not alone there either. The curators of the collection, which uh, now the curators had grown in number to reflect the different areas of specialization of the National Gallery, also went to Wales along with the research library. So imagine the situation. They're off, you know, around the slate mine in Wales, but conducting research and actually in that way having a perfectly productive time. They are uninterrupted by other kinds of duties. And in fact, several catalogs of different parts of the collection were produced uh, through the research conducted during the war by these curators. Every month, however, one painting left its safe storage in Wales to return to the National Gallery and go on solitary display. Forty-three paintings in all were shown this way to boost wartime morale. And it's important that they chose some of the most, most important paintings in the collection. These are paintings by people such as Rembrandt and Titian, beloved works. It was a bit of a risk, but they felt, again, that this was really important for the nation. Lunchtime concerts were also started on a weekly basis at the National Gallery, and they ran for a total of six and a half years from 1939 until 1946, so that the gallery was still a place that people would come to during the war, even if they couldn't see the entire collection. The decision to move the art out as well as the library proved a very wise one. The building was hit by German bombs beginning in 1940 and hit more than once, causing extensive damage to the building. It completely wiped out the space where the library had been, for instance. But this meant that there was no loss of works of art. In 2008, by the way, the National Gallery published a, a, a fascinating book called The National Gallery in Wartime that discusses this whole period uh, and what happened with the art and how, how it was moved and what else happened in the building. It's got lots of photographs. It's, it's a really marvelous uh, study, cultural study of wartime life. In the last 50 years, the National Gallery has continued to develop its collections and respond to changing ideas about the roles of art in society. Now, we've seen that from the very beginning of the museum's history, education was essential as part of the gallery's mission. But the, the definition of what education comprises has expanded greatly to reach out to new constituencies in the country. Admission to the museum remains free. That's really quite extraordinary in the modern world as well in order to reflect the importance of equal access to the artistic treasures it contains. This is a museum that is considered to be the people's property. Over five million people a year from all over the world visit the National Gallery every single year. This is, makes it one of the most important, arguably perhaps the most popular tourist destination in Great Britain. Since we are now discussing the museum's present, let's take our orientation tour of the spaces of the museum. The easiest way to think of them is to divide the main block of the National Gallery into four quadrants and to consider the Sainsbury Wing separately. Let's start with the Sainsbury Wing. This is the newest section of the National Gallery, only opened in 1991. And there were certainly controversies over various plans for it, uh, early, uh, choosing the correct architects, finding someone who could be sensitive to the location on Trafalgar Square, to the historical buildings that are already there, quite a to-do. 
an American architectural firm finally won the commission, and they really did produce a marvelous modern building, but that is sensitive to its environment and its mission. Now, what is contained in the Sainsbury Wing is the oldest part of the collections. These are the paintings from the 13th through the 15th century, and they all are on view on one floor. The other floors of the Sainsbury Wing contain special exhibition galleries, restaurants, and museum shops, including an extensive bookstore. Some of the gallery spaces, too, in the Sainsbury Wing were purposely designed. They'd be rather spare and simple, but with some sort of gray trim here and there to make them look a little bit like the chapels of early Renaissance churches in Italy, for instance, a very sensitive environment to the kind of art shown there. From the Sainsbury Wing, you can walk across a pedestrian bridge to the first quadrant of the main building. And on the ground plan, this would be the lower left quadrant. This quadrant contains the 16th century paintings arranged by country, and this was really, I think, the historical heart of the collection. The upper left quadrant is the location of the 17th century paintings. This part of the collection is also extensive, and so these galleries actually extend over to the upper right quadrant. The remainder of the upper right quadrant and the lower right quadrant are devoted to 18th, 19th, and early 20th century paintings. Two additional points should be made here. The paintings are all shown on the same floor throughout uh, the museum. There are a couple of galleries down on the ground floor of the main building, but by and large, the main part of the collection is all on one floor. And that makes traveling from section to section much easier than in some museums. Also, the galleries all tend to converge on what is called the central hall. This is a very large space that is now hung with Venetian Renaissance paintings. This is always a convenient place to go back to for navigation from one quadrant to another, and in a way you can even divide up your visit by choosing to go quadrant by quadrant and then taking a break when you get to the central hall. I have to commend the National Gallery, too, because many of the rooms have comfortable furniture where you can stop take a look at the ground plan, look at the art on the walls from a more comfortable position, or again, just take one needed break. It's wonderful art, but it can be a bit overwhelming if you're trying to do it all at once. Now, ideally, of course, a person should schedule more than one visit to the National Gallery to see the collection in manageable, manageable sections. But even a day or less will definitely be worth your time. The ground floor level of the main building contains a variety of eating and drinking options, a shop, restrooms, coat rooms, and the computer center. The signage of the National Gallery is a model of clarity, as is their printed floor plan. This is a museum that, despite being relatively large, really is easy to make your way around in. While visitors are thronging the galleries and shops, what goes on behind the scenes? Often when we visit a museum, we see the people in the restaurants, running the cloakroom and the guards. But what about all those other people who actually work there every day? A great deal of work takes place behind the scenes that, again, we're usually unaware of, but in fact shapes our experience of the museum greatly. For instance, on a recent visit to the National Gallery, I was able to visit the framing department and speak with some of its staff members. The framers work closely with curators to make sure that the frames around the paintings on display are appropriate, either as originals from the same period as the paintings or as good quality reproductions of period frames, or in some cases as frames from another period, but that somehow complement the qualities of the paintings. It is very rare to have an original frame on a painting. I will mention the few cases that exist in the National Gallery where the frame has stayed with the painting throughout its lifetime, but that's really not the norm. The National Gallery has many frames in a storage room. Some were taken off paintings when better frames were found, or in some cases, frames were actually purchased for potential use down the road. They were perfectly good examples of something the National Gallery thought will work with some painting someday. Frames can be cut down and also built up in size when necessary, and often they require conservation work just the way the paintings they surround do.
Unsurprisingly, many framers are themselves artists and like to work with the challenge of uniting paintings with the right frames. As I said, this really is a collaboration between the curators and the framers. On this visit, I also had a chance to visit the scientific department. This is particularly fascinating for me, but an area of which uh, you know I'm not uh, necessarily, uh, I'm certainly not trained in it and not naturally a scientist, but I love to hear about the work from these people. It's really fascinating. Now, many museums have uh, strong conservation departments where the paintings are taken care of. And often there are some of the research on the paintings will be done simultaneously, scientific research. Interestingly, the National Gallery actually divides these responsibilities into two separate departments. The conservation department that does the work on paintings, cleaning them, repairing them where necessary, and the scientific department. And the scientific department is the department that is responsible for most of the chemistry research, for instance, that goes on in a museum. So the scientists here would study the pigments and the components of oil media, for instance, to learn about the materials that a specific artist used or were used generally in a period. Now, of course, their research is drawn upon by members of the conservation department uh, itself, and these people are also trained as scientists. The conservation department, though, well, as I said, put it into active use, the knowledge they gain for uh, cleaning and repairing the paintings. The conservators will also examine any National Gallery painting that will be leaving the building on loan in order to make sure it's in stable condition to travel. Now, the curators of the collection are important figures. I've mentioned this uh, uh, term a few times already. And they are the scholars that are responsible for conducting research on paintings in the permanent collection, for staging special exhibitions, and for proposing new acquisitions. They have a great deal of responsibility, in other words, for the objects in their care. But of course, they work closely with the conservators, the scientists, the framers, and other people in the museum to make uh, decisions about how to display and interpret the paintings. There are also many educators who work for the National Gallery, helping the curators with interpreting uh, the art for the public. In my opinion, the National Gallery's publication program is the best of any art museum for providing a range of materials for sale that explain the collection in many different ways and at different levels of complexity. I have recommended quite a few of their books on the bibliography for this course and used them myself to prepare these lectures. Finally, the director of the National Gallery is the person ultimately responsible for all of these decisions, and he works closely with the whole staff, as well as serving as the public face of the museum for potential donors and for the Board of Trustees and for government officials. The current director, Nicholas Penny, was earlier a curator at the National Gallery and then also served as a curator at the National Gallery of Art in Washington. Increasingly, the world of museums is a very international one. For instance, uh, two of the curators right now on staff are Americans. Uh, the curator of Dutch painting is a woman who I've known since we were both graduate students in the early 1980s, and this was her dream job in the world to work with the 17th century Dutch paintings of the National Gallery in London. One particularly pleasant task that falls on the curators working with the director is the acquisition of pa new paintings. This does not happen at the same rate and uh, scale as it did in the 19th century, but new acquisitions do come in regularly. When a museum is so rich in the paintings it already has, however, how are decisions made about what to acquire? Well, first of all, that is, in fact, the director's job to see that the different regions and periods of art are all covered adequately. This cannot mean covered equally. That would be impossible at this point. Italian Renaissance painting of the 15th and 16th centuries will always be dominant in this collection since that is what was so favored in the 19th century and early 20th century when so much of the collection was established. But if a terrific painting that could fill a gap in a less well-represented area, say 18th century French painting, became available at the same time as a top-notch 16th century Italian Renaissance painting, 
the curator of Italian Renaissance art would have to make a very strong case to the director uh, while th why that painting should be chosen over the French one. At most museums, the director, director also needs to receive the ultimate approval of the Board of Trustees for these new acquisitions as well. Sometimes, however, a painting uh, will appear that is so remarkable or rare and becomes available on the market that the museum will say, we just have to have that, even if it's by a master already well represented in the collection. Thus, various factors will come into play when considering what works will enter the museum. And from time to time, I will mention re recent acquisitions and explain why I think the National Gallery was interested in acquiring them. Of course, money plays a big role in these decisions, especially today. And the National Gallery is more dependent now than ever before on obtaining outside funds to help make such pur purchases possible. New acquisitions, though, can also come in the form of outright bequests or paintings given in lieu of tax payments. The National Gallery would look much different today and much bare if it were only comprised of paintings bought by the museum itself. Finally, let me describe how this course is organized and how I have chosen the works uh, discussed in it. Each lecture is devoted to a small group of paintings from one period and one geographic region. They will proceed chronologically from the 13th through the 19th centuries. Here are some of my criteria for picking paintings to feature. I have chosen paintings that represent stylistic developments or developments in subject matter. Whenever possible, I have turned to paintings that have documented owners or original locations. I make no apologies for paying more attention to some of the most famous artists of European painting. For not only will people be more comfortable with seeing works by artists they have heard of, these artists often did best express their time and place in the history of art. Some lectures will be devoted entirely or nearly so to a single artist if that painter was both well represented uh, and important in art history. But you will also see some paintings in this course by artists you've likely never heard of if I think those capture something essential of their environment. I'm a soft touch for what I consider to be a beautiful painting but you will sometimes see works that might not be considered beautiful, but that nevertheless are powerful in what they communicate. Finally, I have chosen, whenever possible, works in especially fine physical condition. We can't expect a 500-year-old painting to look perfect, but the closer we can come to its original state, the better we can understand what the painter was doing with the materials. I have one disclaimer to offer as well. I think it is important for you to know when the National Gallery owns more than, say, two paintings by a specific artist, for this will give you a clue that you might have the opportunity to learn more about a certain painter in depth here than elsewhere. So you'll hear me say things such as, the National Gallery owns 20 paintings by Rembrandt. That does not mean, however, that you will see 20 paintings by Rembrandt if you visit the National Gallery. They do try to exhibit as much of their art as possible, but First of all, there just isn't enough wall space for everything at the same time. Other factors, though, could also intervene. One Rembrandt might be in the conservation studio undergoing study. Another might be on loan to a museum for a special exhibition, and so on. Therefore, uh, the numbers that you see that I have given you and that you will actually see on the wall or see listed on the website will not always match. I don't include paintings that are listed as being on loan to the museum in these numbers, even if they're on long-term loan, though, for instance, the website does. So a museum is never a static place, and I mention this time and time again. It changes for many reasons, and we have to be open-minded to see whatever is available uh, there at any given time. Do use their website. It's one of the best websites I know for a museum. Uh, and finally, Enough of the generalities. Let's begin our survey of this great museum in the next lecture, beginning with the very oldest paintings in the collection, the Italian paintings of the 13th and 14th centuries.